Well, it wouldn't be a January if we didn't get my buddy David Serpa in here to talk about the market in 2022. What's going on, brother? Oh, a whole lot. Good, Good to, to see, see you, you, brother. So you are my man up in Temecula, Riverside County, um, Murrieta, French Valley, mm -hmm. um, your office over there. And your area, I would say, has always been like a safe haven for people who are like, hey, you know what, I just want to make my dollar go further. I want bang for my Correct. buck. I want the big house. I want a bigger yard. And it kind of feels like at least the last dozen people who I've encouraged to look in that direction, like it's sort of disappearing. Is it gone? It is disappearing. It is this, the safe haven is disappearing. It's becoming extraordinarily difficult at this point at the uh, the 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 lower price point in every city. So, um, you know, five to six hundred thousand in Temecula, Murrieta, Winchester, uh, two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand in San Jacinto and Hemet, and it's because uh, so much big money is being spent in real estate, buying up these asset assets, these commodities, and it's a you know safe place to put a lot of money. So you've got these Black Rocks and Blackstones and Zillows buying up astronomical amounts of real estate and really pricing people out of not only home buying, but home renting. And so, you know, where are they going to go? Yeah, so it's a, it's, we get to that difficult situation where we have a housing crisis. Let's call it what it is. Mm -hmm. This is a housing crisis. We do not have enough homes. Correct. There's not enough inventory for the amount of households that we have. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the situation that we're in. It's all over Southern California. It's all over the country, really. Mm -hmm. There's certain markets still, like if I go back to Missouri where I'm from, like where I've been, I tried to buy investment properties all year last year and was unable to get a single one. Mm -hmm. They want to sell to the family. Like that just values wise, the way the people are there, like is that a California investor? Hell with him. Mm -hmm. You know, they won't, they won't take my offer. But you know, here it, it, it's, it's a little bit different. You called it a managed, what is it, a managed, managed crash? A managed crash. And I thought that that was probably one of the most intelligent things that I've heard anyone say about this market in a long time because that's what we have. We talked about how we continue to overinflate real estate. We continue to overinflate, you know, these stocks, <clears throat> NFTs, you know, people putting money into, you know, a stupid, you know, painting, a JPEG, uh, a JPEG that somebody could screenshot on their computer. It's stupid. Uh, people buying up real estate in the metaverse. And meanwhile, people are really struggling where I live in the Inland Empire. Because I hear you talking, you say, oh, you know, most of my clients have some Bitcoin and whatnot. I'm like, most of my clients do not have Bitcoin. <laughs> like, I have the clients that are really struggling to make ends meet. And so what's happening for them is a lot of them are either first-time home buyers and they're trying to make their dollar stretch, right? They're either looking for acreage for five to 600000 and you could get it out there. I'm talking five acres for five to 600000 They're looking at trying to buy in the neighborhood that they've been renting in for a long time and they're finding it extraordinarily difficult or uh, they're looking to hang on somewhere near where they currently live and uh, there are people that are either extraordinarily realistic about that and they say hey listen I know I'm gonna pay five six seven hundred dollars more a month than I am right now but I know that I have to do it in order to buy and then there are people who are like listen I'm barely doing it right now at 1500 my landlord who I love is now either selling my house or they are gonna increase my rent by $300 a month, $400 a month, $500 a month, and they can't afford it. So what happens to them? Do you have any rent control up there? Is there any kind of? No. There's none, no man, okay. So we have it down here now. Mm -hmm. um, it's still like 5%, you know, it's mm -hmm. not like it's a, a little bit, you know, like, but uh, um, <clears throat> that would be probably the next step up there, I imagine, because there's gonna be a lot of people who've been renting for a long period of time mm -hmm. that are going to get payment shock. A lot of landlords don't realize how much they can get for rent. Correct. That is a big, that's probably the biggest issue I see and probably one of the things that will buoy the housing market even further as landlords realize. And the story just came out, CBS just did this like a week ago mm -hmm. um, and they put it out on a map and said, look, this is how much rents went up across the county. Bingo. 20%. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you're a property owner and you're just kind of coasting with your, in, in, uh, your tenants, you're going to see that and go, wait a minute. I haven't raised the rent in a while. Correct. Years. That's coming. And, and so like a lot of the mom and pop investors, they're like, oh, well, I haven't raised the rent in years. And suddenly I can put this on the open market, even if I lose my tenants, and rent it for $800 more a month. And then you also have people who are working two jobs that are driving for Grubhub or they're driving Uber. And that possibility of home ownership is going away. And, uh, you know, when we look at this manipulated crash, and we look at the way that wealth resets and recycles, um, well, geez, well, one in five of these home buyers are in cash. So what does it mean to them if the feds decide to increase the rates? 
but your first time home buyer, your people that are just barely making it happen, they're the ones that are gonna be squeezed out. And uh, so I do think that, um, you know, even if prices flatline, which I think, you know, what will, that will happen, um, at that lower echelon, I think that they'll continue to maybe go up a little bit. You'll continue to see that competition because those are the properties that make great rentals. Yeah, they make great rentals, and so the big money is coming for them. Big time. That whole that, that Davos yeah. money, that mm-hmm. like you will own nothing and be happy money, right? Yeah. And so um, home ownership as a dream, as a reality, is deplenishing. Um, less and less people have that as even a reality. And they're seeing it, and they're saying, geez, well, what am I doing working two minimum wage jobs when I know that I'm never going to be able to qualify to buy a house. Um, and then worse, you have a lot of people who lost their jobs due to COVID and you know the, the forced business shutdowns and whatnot. And they're being forced to sell their home to tap into that equity and so that they could pay off their debts because credit card debt is at an all-time high. So there's this whole, you know, this Great Depression that it really is looming um, because we have a lot of the deregulation that happened prior to the first stock market crash in 1929 um, and the, it continues to do this. And so unfortunately, that lower echelon, they get squeezed. They're no longer able to buy real estate. Uh, the, the top wealth earners, where all that money is being concentrated, all that, those tax cuts are going and whatnot, those are the people that are gonna continue to do what Blackstone is doing, or BlackRock is doing. And they're gonna buy quietly assets, like a home provider, at $6 billion. And, uh, and next thing you know, those portfolios are gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the possibility of ever owning your home paying off your home, not paying off someone else's home, get smaller, and the likelihood of becoming an employee working for someone else's business, and I'm talking a large business, becomes more and more likely. Um, And so my heart breaks right now for the average person in this economy uh, because there's a lot of heartbreak happening right now in this economy. It's my greatest fear that one day home ownership will be so rare amongst people that it'll be something that if, unless you're parents or grandparents left a house for you, you will not be able to buy. Mm-hmm. It. Just, well, you won't, it won't be possible. Mm-hmm. And so I, I do feel some urgency. Oh, and yeah. and I, I, I'm not like just a, a real estate salesperson. I am bullish about real estate and how could you not be for mm-hmm. so many reasons? Um, but we are in a situation where a lot of people have been priced out. And even the people who are qualified, mm-hmm. if they're sort of like barely qualified, they have a hard time getting into a home. They're like, wait a second, I qualify for 600,000, but what's my monthly payment? Yeah. Right. So that's what happens when you commoditize something like housing and you have pricing go up and up and up and up. And then you cut interest rates and you cut interest rates and you take away loan restrictions for VA loan limits in it. You know, and for FHA increases largest in history, you're thinking, oh, I'm empowering home buyers. But what you're doing is you're putting people in a situation to where more and more of that monthly payment is going towards their mortgage, and uh, it's becoming less and less of a likelihood that they're ever going to truly own their home, pay off their home. Um, and so, you know, geez, in the 1950s, 1940s, when people were buying homes before the FHA loan and the VA loan and whatnot, before the 30-year loan, you had people uh, buying their house for about three times their annual wages. That doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. There's, that's just not even a possibility. You've got two households, you've got people working two and three jobs, and uh, I agree with the sense of urgency because what happens for our children and what happens for a lot of these people who they give up on buying, they say, oh, you know what, all my stuff is in storage, I'm month to month, my landlord has told me I'm out on the 30th and I don't have anywhere to go. And they, I, I am getting into that situation more and more often that there's this sense of urgency around buying and they're the people at 250000 at 300000 in Hemet and San Jacinto. They're the people at 600000 in Murrieta and Winchester, that when those interest rates go up even minutely, that monthly payment goes up significantly, and all of a sudden they're priced out, and then where do they go? Because we're not building affordable housing. We're not. That's the biggest problem. The houses that are being built are expensive, Mm -hmm. um, and they have to be in order to be profitable, you know, and and I wouldn't want to be a home builder. I mean, have a multi-year project, who knows what's gonna happen in the market, have to put all this money out first before you get a dime back. That's a tough gig to go into. Correct. The incentives are just not there. Well, and you have a situation where you're talking about, well, hey, you know, I was looking at buying another property and I wasn't able to do it. And it's like, because you're getting bid out by the Blackstones. Correct. By the Black Rocks, the people who are able to afford to go 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 over, and they're no longer fixing and flipping. 
They're no longer slapping lipstick on a pig and putting it on the market and making 12,000, 20,000, 70,000 bucks. They're long-term holding. And then so it really, it does t terrible things for our neighborhood. Um, it's doing terrible things for the dollar. It's, the, you know, the stocks, it's, these stocks are crashing across, a lot of these tech stocks, these luxury stocks, right, are crashing. And so what happens when more and more people say, oh, you know what, I gotta sell. You know, I don't, I don't have the ability to lose. And I don't have the ability to lose and lose on, on this stock, or I don't have the ability to lose big on Bitcoin. And so, yeah, a lot of the big people, hey, listen, buy, buy, because it's gonna bottom out. But how far can it go down for your average everyday day trader? Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, without them really sacrificing. Yeah, being hit hard and it making an impact on what their opportunity is for oh, real yeah. estate. Because I mean, it's a, <clears throat> if you're an investor, the first thing you do is you buy your own home to live in. Mm -hmm. That's your first investment that you should make. You should save up the money, do that, because if you do nothing else but that, that's mm -hmm. the only thing you get accomplished in your entire investment life, you'll have a, a paid off home one day, you'll own it free and clear, it, you'll be able to leverage it if you need to, be able to give it to your kids, be able to live in it, it'll, it'll provide tax advantage, you will have right. something there that's good that works. And more and more I'm having that conversation with people, right? Because they'll talk, say, hey listen, is this house gonna be a good investment for me? Or hey, should I spend a bunch of money on my house and then put it on the market? I'm like, listen, unless you have somewhere to go, and you're gonna be buying again. And this is if you're going to a different state, if you're buying land, if you're upgrading or downsizing, whatever it is, unless you are actually in escrow on that replacement property, um, you are really sacrificing uh, a lot by selling your home, paying off some debts, and then trying to buy back into this thing, um, no matter where you go. And so like you said where you're from, and where was that? Missouri. Missouri, people will say, oh well, I'd really prefer to sell it to uh, a, family. a family. Well. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that's not the case in a lot of these markets. They're looking at it and they're looking at the bottom line. And who can blame them? Yeah. And so we talk about legislation. We say, well, we need to build low-income housing. But if we're going to build low-income housing, what we also need to do is we need to protect it by, with legislation saying, uh, this low-income housing is for homeowners mm. to come in and buy. Or you know, maybe we introduce legislation saying that we have to disclose whether or not it's going to be a primary residence. Uh, because you're right, people do want to sell it to a family. Yeah. But at the end of the day, um, you know, if you're being offered twenty thousand dollars more from an investor versus you know twenty thousand dollars less from a family, most people are, are going to take that investment money. Yeah, you're getting tax free in a lot of cases. You know, depending upon how much gains you've had. Yeah. Um, and then it's a rental forever. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. And that's what I'm afraid of is that these homes that are being bought up by these black rocks is that. Those houses will never be owned by an individual ever again. Ever again. And they're just going to keep stacking and stacking and stacking and stacking. And over Correct. time, how long will it take them to take it all down? Correct. Well, a lot of investors right now are really almost wedging against the dollar, right? So, like, they're buying up massive amounts of real estate because, you know, that's smart. They're buying up, you know, they'll buy Bitcoin or they'll do the, these different things. But because right now our dollar, what is it based on? You know, it's not a gold standard. We left that a long time ago. Is it yeah. the petrodollar? And really, you know, are we drilling? And how much are we drilling? And then where's our oil coming from? And a lot of these countries are saying, hey, listen, well, we're no longer going to do business in the dollar because it's unstable. You printed 40% to 50% of the dollars that are in record this last year. You're devaluing global currency because we're the world reserve. And uh, so what happens when people start breaking our dollar? And what happens when countries start betting against our dollar? Well, we have 900 foreign military bases that prop that up. And so right now we're sort of going like this to the rest of the world. We're saying, listen, transact on the dollar or else, right? And then that gives us access to the printing press. But what happens when the rest of the world says, hey, listen, we're no longer going to be threatened by America, by these 900 foreign military bases, by their perpetual printing and devaluation of global currency. And when they start levying against us, that's what makes me worried. Because you look at the Chinas and the Russias that are playing the long-term game, and you look at the fact that we're not manufacturing. People say, oh, well, there's a huge supply chain issue. Well, there's a huge supply chain issue because we're not building, we're not manufacturing, we're importing. Right. When you get to a point to where real employment, <laughs> you know, 40%, 50% of people just flat out are not working, right? And, uh, and we're not building anything. And these entry level jobs are just gonna be entry level forever. There's no career growth or trajectory. Right. And so people look at something like real estate, which appreciates year over year, eight, 18 to 20 percent recently, right. instead of two and a half to three percent, and they say, "I can't afford that. I didn't get an 18 percent raise last year." And so more and more of us get squeezed into the rental market. And then what happens when people can no longer afford to rent? 
they can't the afford question. to buy, they can't go to Wisconsin, there's no jobs out there for them or whatnot, or I'm sorry, was it Wisconsin? Missouri. Missouri. <laughs> and so what happens to these people? And I think that that is what we're getting ready to witness. So what do you think that all means for this year? For just 2022, you know, we saw almost a 20% appreciation last year. Oh, sure. And we also saw rents go up about that same amount, about Correct. 20%. Um, what do you think 2022 is going to look like? So largest increase in history in rental market last year on record. And, uh, and so we, uh, we're going to see Great Depression level housing issues where we've commoditized housing to such a degree that, you know, we know in this country we would rather see housing sitting empty and owned by a bank than, uh, you know, uh, somebody being able to move in and them reducing the price. So I think that what will ultimately end up happening is the entry level to home ownership is going to become higher and higher and more difficult to attain at all of the entry levels to the markets. And I'm saying 250 to 300,000 Hemet San Jacinto, 500 to 600,000 Murrieta, Temecula, Winchester, Menifee, right? Um, so I think a lot of those prices, they're going to sustain. They're going to be around five to 600,000, 250 to 300,000. If anything, they go up a little bit. Now, I think the major difference is those homes that are five bedroom homes, you know, four bedroom homes, 2,800 square feet, 3,600 square feet. A lot of those homes, I think we might even see a little bit of a dip. Like we're already seeing, we're seeing price reductions in those mid-range homes, <clears throat> Okay. right? But we're seeing price increases in those lower range homes mm. because that's where a lot of the competition is. There's less people that can qualify in my market at 800,000, 900,000. There's a lot more people that can qualify in barely at five to six or two to three 350,000 at the, up at, like I said, in Hemet and San Jacinto. Okay, so maybe overall the market might seem flat, but you're gonna see the lower price points probably get a bump and then the higher price points might come in a little bit. Correct, because the, the entry level to home ownership is gonna become harder to attain, right? Um, and what will happen is there will be that sort of bubble, right? Of like what is lower income to middle income and then you're going to have the unattainable oligarchy bourgeoisie wealth. <laughs> <laughs> the bourgeoisie. Uh, you know, the kind of wealth that makes you want to fire up the guillotines. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, it's great to have you. Thank you so much for making the drive Always down. Always good to see you, It's great to see you, my friend. Hey, guys, share this video with your friends. Let's help make them smarter than everyone else.